I'm Midnight Agent Raw. And I'm Okame. We are the Super Media Bros Podcast, and we are founding members of the Odd Pods Media Network. Hi, I'm Sam. I'm Richie. And I'm Little Matt. And here at the 500 Section Lounge, we have a few requirements. First, you've got to be able to talk about anything at all. Secondly, you need to be able to laugh, play games, and talk to some very interesting people. From sports radio personalities to reality television contest finalists and everything in between, we talk to them all. Yeah, it's all right here in the lounge. So be on the lookout for what we do next. And always be there to grab a listen. listen. Murder King, have it your sleigh. Go, Mitchell, go, Mitchell, go. The game of Parmesan. All that and cheese. Are you ready to play the game? Fushan. Super Media Bros. We're just pointing at each other for no reason. The Fushan stands. The Fushan, the Fushan abides. <laughs> so does the Olympics. Diplomacy states <laughs> that we Fushan until dawn. Fushan until th- that that would be a great movie. <laughs> Jim Cotton to Fushan till the dawn. dawn. And it's just us pointing at each other like this the, cover. the whole time. <laughs> God damn it. Why don't we have someone taking a picture of our stupid shit like this? I don't know. One One of these days. Welcome to episode 164 of the Super Media Bros Podcast. I'm Midnight Agent Raw. And I'm Okami. Cole Cinema Showdown 69. Nice. Is here. Hey. Jim Cotta versus American Rickshaw. Now you might be asking yourself, why the fuck are these two movies going against one another? Well, we're here to tell you why. Olympic medalists and athletes. Yeah, apparently people thought it was a good idea to get Olympic gymnasts. Olympic gold medal winning gymnasts. Because that sells films. Let me just tell you, one of these is a film. <laughs> the other we're not so sure. Yeah. But that's kind of the idea for the last 68 episodes up until now. Yeah, I mean, shit. One of these is a film, the other one, hmm, not so much. We're still thinking about it. Let's get into Jim Cotta. Jim Cotta is a 1985 martial arts, <laughs> no, uh, martial arts film. Just, just take that line out. This is a film. Jim Cotta is a 1985 film starring Olympic gymnast Kurt Thomas as Jonathan Kabat Kabat Kabach. He kabotched everything. Yeah. An Olympic gymnast. Gee, he's playing himself who combines his gymnastic ability with martial arts that he actually fucking doesn't know to enter a deadly competition in a fictional country called Parmistan, which we will refer to from here on out as Parmesan because God damn it's so cheesy. Yeah. Plus, Parmesan just sounds funnier, and it sounds better, and it sounds more enticing to go to. Sounds pleasing to the palate. Hmm. So this movie opens on an episode of Ninja Warrior. No joke. Like, <laughs> two, two things are happening here. We don't know how they correlate at all, because one, it's literally a guy getting chased through the countryside by European-ish looking ninjas. On horseback. Yeah. It's like the Spanish Inquisition, but in black robe. (laughs) The other end, while this is all going on, you get Mr. (laughs) Is his name Kurt? I forgot. Yeah, his real name is Kurt, but he's so he's it's John. It's Kurt. It's Kurt. He's literally just doing balance beams and gymnast shit on a black. Like it's that like point of view shot from underneath him where he's just doing flips on a balance beam and shit. He's showing the Jim Kata essence that he does not ooze. Right. But yeah, the guy in the countryside doing Ninja Warrior ends up getting arrow to the, I think it's the rib, like underneath one of the ribs. Yeah. And he's <laughs> literally like rope walking or rope climbing across this bridge and just pew shot. There's so many falling deaths in this movie. <laughs> You guys know that sound effect we always play the that 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 is that exact 
the sound effect gets played a lot and we were just dying the whole fucking time what movie was that from when we watched that the first time it was um killing american style god damn it god <laughs> what a movie too <laughs> fucking way that sound effect gets played so much in this one so when we get introduced to jonathan doing his gymnast shit that he does because you know we need to establish that this american actual fucking olympic gymnast is an actual gym is an actual gymnast in this continuity we're not convinced yet so he leaves this competition and he gets approached by the fucking special intelligence agency which they actually don't really come out and say to the to your face you just kind of like who the fuck is this guy and he's just like hey i'm here to tell you about parmesan it's this country made of cheese we need you to go in there and play the game, which is pretty much just an endurance race with obstacles while you're being chased by Parmesan warriors. <laughs> Every person who enters this country has to win, but nobody's won this competition outside of the country in 900 years. Because everybody's died. They've drowned in G's. Ooze and cheese. But if you win somehow, you are granted your life and a wish. We would actually like to choose your wish for you because fuck your dreams, kid. So, yeah, they, they want to use him <laughs> to use his wish to install a fucking United States satellite monitoring station, which could monitor all satellites in space and act as an early warning system in case of a nuclear attack. Don't they do like they try to do that in Parmesan? Yeah, they, yeah, exactly. This was done with MGM like they had their hands in this and whatnot. And as soon as I started watching this film, it all started to click because I was getting so moonraker vibes or like james bondish type of vibes like not a whole lot but i was getting that vibe straight to the point while i was literally like this guy is and like giving a briefing on we want this super space station being built here so we can do a b c d f but also at the same time you must be careful and we're going to help you with this and train you and blah 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 and i'm like are they literally trying to put a gymnast as James Bondish type of spy or some shit? It's James Bond. Yeah. Jim Bond. <laughs> no, it's what, why, why it's is, Gold Bond. <laughs> I was about to say, why does it sound like some like anti-chafing thing for gymnasts? He, he, Jim Bond. Mr. Gold Bond, sir. Yes. We would like you to meet this princess that will handle your training. Her name is Princess Rubali. And she is ready to train the fuck out of you in this montage of stupidity. You guys remember, I don't know how many episodes ago, we talked about how the pointless falling in love scenario it happens so quick on some movies. This one's probably the quickest. Is this one on par with like Halloween three season of the witch, like think, five days and half his age guy. Yeah. Cause it was quicker than that. It was way quicker than that. 14 minutes in. She hasn't said a fucking word. Like at least with Halloween three, like they had a bit of progression, right? A little bit of character development between the two. No, this was just them beating the shit out of it. Well, her beating the shit out of him. And, all of a sudden, he just erect for her. Hi, yeah. Uh, and like you said, just not even 15 minutes into the film, and he's just goo goo gaga over this bitch. But he's trained, like enough. Yeah, so he's trained. He's well armed, I guess. And now he's being boated off to Parmesan. Yeah. Well, we're gonna we're gonna send you to somewhere in Carabao on the Caspian Sea. So you can enter Parmesan and then your name will be John Parmesan. Not really. No. But while he's in Carabelle or Carabao, whatever the fuck, while he's, while he's in route to Parmesan, he gets attacked by these dudes and then they steal the princess. But I had to laugh my ass off because like the dude that meets him, his, his name's Mackle, but I call him Macklemore because it's just funny. Mackle and more. Right. And they're like touring through this little town. Like it, whenever he gets attacked, he's touring through like this little shop alley or some crap. And they're just like, oh, it's an American. I'll fucking sell you this dirt cheap. And he's just like, no, all this looks really cheap. It's like watching dark Agrabah. Right. But what I laughed at is as soon as the princess finds a fucking knife is the first time that she says anything. Mm -hmm. She's like, knives turn me on. I don't know. Like she had that ejector blade in the beginning to like teach him you know how she is basically right but then this dude walks up to john and he's like oh hey and he's like are you american he's like yeah he's like splashes him with water go home yankee and then his dude next to him just gets shot with a fucking arrow who knew water being thrown in the face causes such a tantrum for the whole civilization 
I don't know. Go home, splash <laughs> arrow. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Hit you with water. That's not good enough. Hey, Frankie, shoot his buddy over there. <laughs> he fucking dies. You're such a disgrace. I'm going to kill your partner. Well, what's fucked up is like he doesn't die immediately. He just sits there. He's like, oh, oh. And he just like sits down. He does it, the whole Boromir shit from uh, Lord of the Rings. He's yeah. Like, One arrow. That's not enough. Two arrows. That's still not enough. Three. <laughs> okay, maybe that's enough. <laughs> I'm fucking, feeling it. I'm feeling it real hard. So fucking John chases this asshole and a few other assholes like through this alleyway. And then we get like the flip, what I call like the flip flop and fly. Th- this was the scene that we had to rewind like a couple of times because we were like, what the fuck is this shit? Isn't this the part where they had like all these ironically placed beams and poles and shit? I, I don't remember. This is the one where he cuts the cartwheel in front of the dude and leaps in the air. And you're like, he just falls over for no fucking reason. Oh, da- God damn. Is this what Jim Cotta really is, people? Yeah, apparently. Like, you're literally fighting three guys, like, hand-to-hand combat, which is not much hand-to-hand, but still. And he does this sideways cartwheel flip thing. And the guy that he does it to or towards, he's so enamored by the fact that he performed this. He's like, man, I could never do this. Oh, my God. I'm so ashamed of myself. I just <laughs> falls over. He's not even touched by this dude. Like, not even, like, a aggressive wind from the legs going down. It's just, oh, oh I could never do it. Fuck. <laughs> this man is so graceful. I'm just going to fall over. My fat ass is useless. Uh. Dies. Actually, he doesn't die. He gets fucking KO'd with like a box, like a fucking wooden box. Like this, like John just lifts it with ease and just uh, over his head. You know, that's one of the most believable parts of all the fighting sequences, because I'm going to say right now, the fighting in this film is fucking stupid. And I say this for, for this reason alone. The choreography to do the gymnast style, like flips and cartwheels and stuff, it's I don't know if they edited it like they didn't edit it good enough or it was just do your cartwheels and we'll we don't care. But like they'll work around whatever he improvs on set. Yeah, there was a little bit more time for him to perform his actions and then do the attack. Like it was not like quick to the point, like most like Kung Fu or like, you know, hand to hand combat type films. It was like drawn out moves in between each other. Like he doesn't ever look like he's actually in danger. Yeah, like, he'll do this, like, running start. Like, he's about to do the mat thing where they do, like, little cartwheels and flip shit. Like, he's rounding himself up to go. And then he does the attack. And I'm like, I, I can't get into this. <laughs> it, was, it was so dumb. Like, really fucking. It's like, hold, hold on, hold on. Let me get my, my hands up. Okay, we're good. Now I flip. But what made this scene very laughable to me was when he rounds the block and he comes back up to the dude that got shot. He is, like, just covered in blood like his whole suit is just fucking ruined and he just looks like he spilled a ton of uh, spaghetti sauce on himself from the parmesan i literally just i was thinking while i was watching that scene it was like revolution 909 from daft punk <laughs> yeah <laughs> well he died learning how to make tomato sauce stop the movie and go home <laughs> i repeat stop the movie and go home literally like the whole fucking market just goes so John takes it upon himself. He's like, you know what? I'm going to do this alone. And it's like really fat fucking chance, my dude. Yeah, because there's a Mac hotel. And it's like, no, you can't go into the palace or the castle or the, the stronghold or whatever this building that he's holding the princess in. It's like, you can't do this by yourself. I'm going to. And that's another fucking problem right there. Kurt's acting is non-existent. He's the same monotone persona the entire film. All he does is, my body does the talking. Dude, and the way he flirted with the princess, I'm like, how the fuck did she fall for this, like, mullet gymnast guy? I mean, fuck, Hacksaw Jim Duggan's 2x4 that comes to the ring with him for every fucking match has more personality than this guy. I mean, that's the only thing I can think of. The flips were amazing. It just ripped right. my engines. But we forgot to talk about that scene whenever he was getting trained. Like he's trying to talk to her and shit and he starts mocking her where he, he he's looking at her and then he does like this. Well, let me just cut like a twisting front flip and he lands back facing backwards to her and he's like, oh, I'm fine. Thank you. And then he flips back around to talk to her and he's like, blah, 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 blah. Still no response. Flips again. <laughs> Dude. If I were her, I would have already stabbed him. There would be no Jim Cotta. There would be no Kurt Thomas going to fucking Parmesan. It would be just like, fuck this dude. Pull that damn knife, the little trigger one, just slice his dick right off. 
I'm just go for the juggler. I'm done. Like right. that, dude, that dude needs to stop. Like he flipped like six times in that sequence. I'm, and, I, I'm <laughs> telling you, that's what this film is marketing. That like they're milking the shit out of the fact that he's able to do this stuff. Right. God. But any fucking way, the princess is kidnapped. John shows up to rescue her and he fights this Abraham Lincoln looking fucking guy and another fucking dude in the way that they fall over these banisters and that they fucking scream like the one fucking guy gets fucking just (laughs) punched and he just falls over and then like halfway through the fall you just hear (laughs) and then he hits screech yeah yeah, and then he hits the second guy and you just hear him fall and he just goes ow (laughs) why I don't know if he got hurt from the punch or from the fall. It's like, ow. He got bit by a fucking mosquito on the way down. Ow. (laughs) (laughs) He bent the nail or something like, ow. (laughs) Right, dude. But this, this one, I I fucking laugh at because John fucking busts into this room and he grabs a gun and just fucking mows this bastard down in cold blood. And not once does John, like who is supposed to be like this fucking like blonde haired, blue eyed, like all American dude just gets sucked into this fucking situation. Not once does he have any fucking moment where he goes, oh my God, I've killed someone like, and freaks the fuck out because wouldn't you freak the fuck out? Like this man has like nothing. Well, didn't you know, Richie, all gymnasts are cold blooded murderers. Oh shit. I think the gold medal actually makes them more impervious to the fear and the like anxiety of killing someone. You know that meme where that chick is fucking doing math all over the fucking screen? That's mm. me right now trying to figure out what the correlation between a gold medal and a gymnast and being a cold-blooded killer is. I'm like, fuck, I need to stay away. Goes to show you, you know, what the Olympics are really about. <laughs> right? <laughs> well, they chase his ass again. And we've come to the conclusion that all the gunmen in this film are former stormtroopers because they can't hit shit. They may as well be called palm troopers at this point. Yeah, they were the extras. And we find out that uh, old Mackle, his fucking handler, has betrayed him to the enemy. Like, we, <laughs> why? Whatever. So but, he saved the girl, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, because they're going back to this warehouse thing. Because there was like this giant fucking chase where they're like on foot running through the city. And none of these guys can hit them or chase them with a car. They just get away somehow. We forgot about the handmaiden that was tending to him. Because. The- oh, my fucking God. <sighs> Y'all, this lady reminded me of someone from here in Sulphur. <laughs> it's the whole town in one person. Okay. This lady was clearly, I want to say 50s, maybe. But what just startled me the most was one, her eyes are like huge. And I mean, like, you can see like every white of her fucking cornea and shit huge. Second of all, they just. Dis- Disgustified. I know that's not a word, but that's the word I'm using. They disgustified her fucking mouth to where it's like pitch black and just oozing with. And I seriously thought the entire time she was tending to John that she was trying to like, I, I, I can suck dick. I can, oh. Oh, I can slob your knob. She's got no tongue. Yeah. I, I can do it. How do you do that without a tongue? I tell you. <laughs> I tell you. Oh, God. Nom, nom. <laughs> nom, nom, nom. Oh, What's God. your name? Nom, nom. Nom, nom. <laughs> oh, God. But eventually, you know, here and there. He gets I, his dick sucked. Yeah. Here and there happens, and he holds her at knife point with this, like, fucking curvy looking blade. He looks like he stole it from the dinner table. Yeah. He sneakily, <laughs> you know, coerces her to follow to go to the room that the princess is being held in. That's right. That's how he finds her. He's like, yeah. where's the princess? Yeah. And he's like, I know she's not in another fucking castle. Where's the princess? They get to this, the, the room where supposedly she's in and it's the camera is behind one of those like screen doors that has like the white, like opaque filter over it. So all you see is the shadow and all you see is like, take this. <laughs> and it, it, I mean, it's, suggestive enough to where you get like a phallic idea of like okay take the dick <laughs> you finally get your <laughs> your, your payment <laughs> I'm not I'm not so they fucking leave after the whole betrayal bit in the warehouse right so like John I guess it's John's fuck I don't who the fuck shoots the guy 
It's like the it's the fucking uh, agent from SIA, I guess, shows up and fucking saves him or whatever. But then they immediately like use a raft that they're gonna float down into Parmesan, where they are taken captive by the Parmesan warriors after a fight on the little ba- embankment that's there. Yet again, just beautifully choreographed Jim Cotta fighting. He's like defending the raft, like violently defending the raft because those ninjas are like, I'm going to fucking stab this raft. And he's like, no, you fucking don't. And he's just like, <laughs> yeah, he's fuck a, he, you. He's not a stand back, Rabali. I got this. No, raft, are you okay? I'll protect you. The raft, they're rafting me. <laughs> they're rafter me. The rafter is coming. The rafter is, yes. Because uh, yeah, that one ruffian just, he's like, I'm going to stab it. Like he literally grabs the raft. He's like, hey. I'm done do it. <laughs> no! <laughs> You're gonna stab my wrath and then me. Oh my god! god. <laughs> Save me, Super John. No. You're a dick. He just fucking deflates and just floats down river. Or it sinks down river, I should say. Just said no reminds me of that the do dialogue from uh, Fire Emblem. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> But anybody thinks they fucking knock John out and he wakes up and he's in the palace in the king's palace who is, you know, her, the princess's dad. And he is introduced to Commander Zamir, who we find out in this entire moment is actually planning a coup against the fucking king and wants to sell the satellite rights to the enemy. That whole sequence I talked about earlier was actually here, not before. So, um, yeah, it's all right. This movie is very confusing. Yeah. Because we get introduced to Thorg or Thor, bro. Whatever the fuck is the it, it is, is it is Thorg, but he's I swear to God, he looks like jacked up. He's like Robert Sadar without the chin. Yeah, but he he's dressed like fucking Josh Brolin from the Goonies. Yeah, straight up like the gray like cut off sweatshirt with the long sleeves underneath it and the red headband. It's all the working out that he was doing in the Goonies with the fucking, you know, weight bench and everything. Like, this is what he was training for. They never, he never told any of them. He's like, I'm training for Parmesan and I'm changing my name to Thorg because it's not copyrighted if there's a G on the end of it because <laughs> I'm a straight up G. Speaking of being a straight up G, John tried to talk to him. He's like, I'm a fan of yours. And he literally just sat there and stared off like, fucker, stop. You fucking peasant. You talked to me. <laughs> Is there a breeze in my ear? Oh, it's this wimp. It's a wind. It's a little bit windy out here. It's a little oh. wimpy out here, too. Oh. Well, look at you, Mr. Spaghetti Arms and Parmesan. Yeah, we get introduced <laughs> to uh, Geraldo Riviera as the king. Dude, he sw- I swear to God, he looks like fucking Geraldo. It's the... <laughs> it's so stupid. <laughs> like, what the fuck? Like, we, at first we thought he was the grandpa from Willy Wonka. And it was like, no, that's not the same guy. And I was like, oh my God, does he own a talk show? Dude, he turns around in his face and you're just like, oh my God, I, I think this man is going to try to talk to me about Parmesan politics. And he kind of does. Does cheese ruin your life? Find out on the next episode. Oh, Geraldo. <laughs> Geraldo Ricotta. Because we need more cheese than just Parmesan here. To make a long story short, he talks about like this whole fucking, you know, ninja warrior race that everybody's about to fucking do there's a swamp run then a rope climb then you enter the river to the high forest to the village of the damned he says damned because i swear to god he calls it something else later and another five mile run through a swamp you have to avoid obstacles that result in death fuck this game yep so they put a trial game on with three prisoners and they get the fucking shit killed out of them. There's this is the one where we were talking about where the dude is like rope climbing the thing and he falls on the rocks like on camera. It is obviously a dummy, but Jesus fuck, it is hilarious. Mm-hmm. Ah! <coughs> on a rock. Boy, these ragdoll physics are amazing. They really fucking are because it's a ragdoll. Ragdoll falling in a movie. <laughs> and old wimpy John's like. But shouldn't we help them? No. (laughs) So they go back to the banquet. And this is where the king tells John that his father was a hell of a competitor and didn't win. So we find out that his dad actually participated in this shit. But he's like, good luck. Your dad died, but, you know, good fucking luck. You're gonna need it. 
Zamir is groomed to the princess. That is another plot thing here. And he loves size. No, the actual three blade, three tip side. He's like, I'm going to show off. He's like, I'm going to pull my side dick out. Both of them. Only because John was eyeing the princess the entire fucking time. And he's like, no, let me, oh. l- let me show you. Let me do you a number. And he's like doing, I mean, they're, it's pretty legit. I, th- I thought it was pretty cool. And then he just launches both sides literally within six inches of John's face. And then he just goes up and pulls him out. He's like, the girl is mine. <laughs> it's not over yet. Put your hardware back in your pants, Samir. This is where he holds the tongueless woman at knife point. Right. This is that, where it that happens. Whole sequence <clears throat> inserted here. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Princess says that the marriage will rip the country apart because Samir wants to overthrow. But like, you know, the king is not going to believe her or listen to her really because, you know, things have been the way they've always been. And he's too busy with his talk show. That's right. Well, John tells the princess that he's going to win because he meets her after dark. Ooh. But what's funny is about, about this scene is that like the princess is chased off, but then John pulls a fucking Mike Danton and just hops up off the screen from the bottom and just takes these guards out like, wow, <laughs> just fucks them up. And Rabali is literally running in the background, like just wacky inflatable arm for the tomb guy. <laughs> <laughs> runs off. Ah. <laughs> runs away. I'm partially naked under this sheet dress. I'm laughing my ass off because it cuts right to the next day where they're just, they're already waiting to be, you know, released into the race. They all run. And John fucking just trips and just fucking busts his ass. And is it, I don't remember who the fuck it was. I might've been one of the other competitors. They just kick him while he's down like real hard. Mm-hmm. And then he gets up and just, oh, and walks. And Zamir just says, fuck the rules. I'm going now. Rado's like, you can't do that. You're my sidearm, my side piece. He's like, I don't care. My bro. No. <laughs> my fuck boy. No. Oh. <laughs> my fuck boy. No. Oh. Did your fuck boy leave you? Talk to me. Harald Rado. <laughs> God damn it. He's so hurt. No, that's the only thing. He's probably the most hurt about that than he is about the whole mutiny shit. Right? My, my fuck boy left. I was grooming him for you in that way. No. <laughs> oh. So they get to the rock climbing part. And of course, like a couple of dudes die because they arrow them off the ropes and it's fucking brutal. This one guy just gets shot right in the back. Mm-hmm. Instant paralysis just falls. But what makes me laugh is the whole Home Alone 2 lost in New York, you know, booby trap shot because old, our boy old John is just climbing up this one rope and <laughs> look. If you look down and you see somebody about to set your rope on fire and you can just like reach over and grab the rope next to you and just kind of walk to it and keep climbing. Like, wouldn't you do it? Yeah, because that fire took way too fucking long for one. And and then all of a sudden when he reaches the top and climbs over, then the fire just (laughs) just whooshes right past him like quick. It's like, oh, hey, hey, I'm here. Fire everywhere. The whole forest is gone. (laughs) I love watching all these motherfuckers fall to a rocky ass death, dude, because like he kicks this ninja off a cliff, hits the fucking rocks. And then we finally, after like three attempts, we get to see what's past the the rope and gorge section. And it's a bunch of nothing. I was disappointed. But then like Thor body slams this one dude to death. I mean, he just like (laughs) he just scoop slams him. Like, I think it was the guy that uh, kicked John in the beginning of the race. Yeah, I was like, is this no holds barred? Is this rip him? Is he back? Is he just going to body slam into the like the fucking pavement and then the grass and just everywhere? It's Zeus. (laughs) Zeus. (laughs) No, it's Zeus. No, (laughs) no. And then we get John versus Thorg because he's like, I don't want to fight you. You're my hero. And they, they, they beat the shit out of each other. But then Thorg gets fucking shot with an arrow right in the heart. <laughs> and then the, the shot where they're trying to shoot John and the lazy fucking editing right here. Oh God. Yeah. John runs up behind this fucking tree and hides. And then you see like a, just a barrage of fucking arrows, like probably like 20 of them in this tree. And then the tree obviously moves over about like an inch and a half. And the arrows start wiggling faster than they were before. And John just steps up from behind the tree and walks off. Not to mention the uh, lighting was drastically different. Yeah. It was like afternoon to like sunset. (laughs) We're going to shoot this scene at one o'clock. 
We're going to take, oh, about a four-hour launch break, and we're going to come back and film the pickup shot. But won't the sun be a different... It don't matter. No. <laughs> Does this... Does any of this matter? No. The sun is my bitch. <laughs> so John makes it to the village of the crazies because they call it the fucking village of the crazies and it's the fucking village of the damned. So it's the village of the damned crazies. And then this... <sighs> this fucking guy that he fights, the dude with the fucking like curved knife that chops his own hand off. This fight sounds like painful intercourse, dude. Was it that one or was whenever John was climbing that rope? That's part two. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, that was the end of course. The actual, like, yeah. Mm. I just want to know how these people survive because we, like, you pointed that out too. You're like, dude, how the fuck do these people, like, how are they living? Like, there's, you know, they don't feed them or anything. Not unless the people who do make it to that point, that's their food. And then the dude that has the two faces. Yeah, that was kind of trippy. Not so much, but it was trippy. So fucking weird. Just watching his fucking Professor Quirrell face on the back. Like, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Wiggle, <laughs> wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. Because Thorg is alive. But he, like, he, because he comes up during this fight with the two face guy, which made me laugh because I swear to God, the, the back face looked like the Burger King. Yeah. Have it your sleigh. The murder, yeah, the murder, the king. murder king. <laughs> But and yeah, then they're like the Jesus dude with the clan robe with the bare ass. Like it was just the fucking most awkward looking shit. Like swear to God, this dude looks like Jesus in a white robe shows his bare ass. Yeah. Cause as soon as he gets to him, he turns around and is just like nude. No <laughs> carpentry at work. <laughs> right. Then Thor gets his ass kicked by somebody else. He gets shot more times cause he's still alive, but he gets fucking eaten by the pigs. Yeah. They go into the Bay of pigs. Cody, tell everybody about this fucking pommel horse scene for fuck's sake, because I fucking can't even with this shit. Are we going to talk about the uh, orgasm verse or the pommel horse? Oh, absolutely. That's what I'm because fucking go for it, look, dude. He mentioned the intercourse section. That was like the taste, the teaser. First of all, the way this part began was actually interesting. Throughout the whole fucking film, this was one of the most interesting parts. It was like a horror, like very decent score behind like haunting crazy people in the village. I'll give it that. But when John tries to escape, they did voiceover on top of him trying to climb this chasm, basically up these two buildings. (laughs) And yeah, that's all you hear is just John just moaning like a little preteen trying to reach for a bar, but (laughs) Oh, he gets a hand from somebody, just not, not in that way. <laughs> he gets a hand to get picked up. He's like, <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm a man. I'm a man now. <laughs> that was the weirdest part of this whole film was just how, why would they put that voice over that dub over him? You know, they could have at least had like a mic, like a boom pole or something like on top of the roof part. Be like, just, just keep going, John. No, they literally voiced it wasn't John. I mean, it wasn't Kurt. There's no way. It wasn't Kurt. It was like, it almost sounds like someone's like cousin <laughs> came in. It's like, oh, you're making a movie. Can I be a part of it? Sure. Make some noises. Uh, uh. <laughs> uh. We'll put that in. The, the big twist is that the guy that saved John is actually his father. And it turns out that in the beginning of the movie, when we opened on the Ninja Warrior scene, <clears throat> that, was, that was his dad. This part makes me laugh. All right. Like, it's this fucking emotional reunion. Like, his dad was like, yeah, they captured me and they were using me as political bait, blah, blah, blah. Oh, I love you, dad. Oh, I missed you, son. And he, he fucking gets shot with an arrow right in front of John. It's not even fucking five minutes into this, like, emotional scene and he gets fucking shot. And then they cut right to fucking the princess, like the princess trying to tell her dad that he's just basically being played by Zamir. And he's just like, oh, no, there's no way. And then she starts taking her fucking robe off and we're like, wait, whoa, what the fuck? But she's got some like, like black widow skin tight suit on. And then they cut. Yeah, they fucking cut back to Zamir chasing John on horseback. And then they fight. And John fucking Sonya blades his neck, like just breaks it with his legs. Oof. And we had to laugh at this shit because like Zamir army just gets beaten down and seized by the citizens whenever like 
Geraldo decides, oh, fuck these guys. It's a fucking, like, it's a coup. Fuck these guys. John comes back on a horse with his fucking dad, who did not die, is just suffering with a, a fucking arrow in his back, just like, oh, 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 oh. and he's not even fucking worried at all about his dad at this point. He's just like, ah, the princess. And he just leaves his dad on the fucking horse, probably to die. And he runs over and hugs her. I hadn't seen dad in like 20 years, but, but fuck you. You got shot. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, well, dad, (laughs) I won this game. Fuck you. Here's my cum dumpster. I'm gonna go to her. Yep. And (laughs) God damn it. Like he, Jesus, fuck. The crowd is like beating the shit out of these people, right? And the movie ends on a still shot of John hugging the princess, and it literally says that the the wish for the Star Wars satellite system is installed in 1985, and that was boring. So we're here to change the ending for you. The ending is actually the wish was for the original Star Wars film to be theatrically released in Parmesan. The end, and call it the Meth Star. Yeah, and that is Jim Kaka. Let's move on to American Rickshaw, starring Mitch Gaylord, another Olympic gold medalist. I'm surprised. Oh, I, I, I want to start out by saying this dude can act like, holy shit, were we impressed by leagues ahead of fucking. Oh, God. Kurt was. Yeah. Mm hmm. Let's make us let's make this is like, in, uh, well, it was pretty enjoyable. Let, let's let's get right into this because holy shit, dude. It starts with this thumbless fuck putting an artifact in this locker somewhere in, you guessed it, Miami. The central hub of, oh, fucking shit going on. Bro, we are back in Miami. Between American Rickshaw and Miami Connection, fucking weird shit happens in Miami. I want to know what really goes on. Like, does this actually happen? It's like black magic and cocaine. Why are we not in Miami? It's cocaine-fueled black magic, my friend. You got magic, you got Cubans, and you got cocaine. Can't go wrong. Scar fucking face. So Mitch Gaylord plays a character named Scott who helps this old Asian lady off this bench in the rain and her cat and her cat and gives her a ride on his rickshaw. Such a weird scene. (laughs) It sounds exactly as I said, but it was like a summer rain, right? I know that sounds very uh, sensual there. Summer rain raining on this old lady. And she looks up, and there's Scott, a big, beefy gay lord, to help her scoop her up into his arms to put her in the rickshaw. But not quickly. Oh, no. It's very sensual. Very sexual. Her cat's getting wet. And so is her cat. And then, yeah, Scott holds her off in the rickshaw. Yeah. And this is one of the funniest fucking edits that we have ever seen in any fucking movie, right? He brings her to her. I guess, th- this has got to be her high rise apartment that she lives in at this point. Like we find out later, but he brings her there and she, she gives him his money and then she looks over and this dude just runs up to her with a fucking wheelchair and the wheelchair like gets almost where it's going to crash into the camera. And then it cuts to a fucking titty bar. <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's, it's, it's like, Oh grandma, hold on. We're going to get you and go straight to the strip club. Oh yeah. That's what I've been wanting to do. I'm already wet first. That's so fucking, like, why? <laughs> Hurry up before the moisture dries up. Oh. So, there's this guy at the bar. Looks like Vince Offer. God. The perfect scenario for Vince Offer to be in, if I'm speaking, you know, candidly. <laughs> He's going to sham wow the stage so nobody slows and falls. The one these strippers to fall. Sham wow. Look at all that sweat and cum. Shamwow. <laughs> Look at all that stripper sweat. Shamwow. <laughs> Look at all that shame on the dance floor. Shamewow. <laughs> These girls got college to pay for for their kids. <laughs> I'm going to sell all the shamwows I can and fund them through all the courses. There you go. So we find out that this cutscene is six months later. Six months later. Like, where did the time go? Cocaine's a hell of a drug. It really is. Well, this lady had sent Scott a gift in the mail. But, like, before he can finish, some bitch in the apartment just bombards him, which is stupid because I don't think she ever really has anything, like, of 
significance to do with any of the plot for this film other than that kind of i mean yeah she but kind of but that's further but what was the gift all right so this gift it, okay it's pretty much like a talisman but let's be honest it okay it's like a ball with a long like tube string thing it looks like a fucking dick pump i know what y'all are thinking how, how does this look like a dick pump well you gotta think about it this way Ancient Chinese technology here. You stick the tube up in your and you go squeeze, squeeze. You sound like Bill Cosby. <laughs> you put the tube in your butt and pop, and you pop and pop and pop and. <laughs> Ancient Chinese medicine. Turn your dick from jello to pudding pops. We'll make it easy for you. What the hell? That's what we said. <laughs> Scott's just like that old lady. What the hell is she doing? Right. So he does what anybody would do if, like, you got a gift. First of all, he drops the letter down the fucking stairwell because he was bombarded by the the, the apartment chick. And then he just goes and throws it in his top drawer and just shuts it. Like, eh, fuck this gift or whatever. Then we get our boy Donald Pleasance, Dr. Samuel Loomis himself, as Reverend Morton on TV, sounding exactly like crazy Dr. Loomis. Talking about God. Yeah. And then, like, throughout the movie, we get the old lady... Which you find out her name is Madame Moon. She's obviously returned from the strip club six months later because now she's seeing Morton on TV and then her Cobra. Yeah, yeah, we're not joking. Her Cobra gets pissed off and is like hissing the fuck out in his little glass area in her apartment. And her cat gets pissed off too and fucking hisses. And so does her cat. A lot of Chinese witchcraft going on. Yeah, we kind of find out that she is a witch. I mean... It was obvious, but still. The magic penis pump. And like these rats are chewing on the letter that he dropped. Like that's a shot that happens a few times. Like these rats are just pissing shit and eating this fucking letter to, to hell and back. He eventually finds the damn letter and he can read it. Like I yeah. don't understand how you can read it through fucking nibbles and piss. Yeah. Well, the Rev takes this phone call that he doesn't really want to take in the first place. It's Brow. It's Brow. <laughs> it's mean. I want to get those clips and put them together where he's just like, tell him I'll take it in my office. Hello, this is Reverend Morton. It's Brow. <laughs> <laughs> and he's just like, the package has arrived at its, desti- at its designation. Bring it now. Meanwhile, Scott takes this Really, really hot chick on his American rickshaw. Yeah, dude, Joanna. Yeah. Like, she talks him into going on to her boat. And he's going to flat out refuse at first. And Cody and I are sitting on the couch like, no, no. Of all the movies, no, you do not want to just sit out. Go, Mitchell. Go, Mitchell. Go. Never turn down a redhead. Bruh. That's my motto. (laughs) Bruh. (laughs) He rolls up into that fucking boat. And they are about to get it the fuck on, son. But it feels like the old woman is having something to do with this because she keeps, like, appearing in these, like, thought things or some shit. T-H-O-T. Mm-hmm. Thought. Because she is a thought. So we thought. (laughs) That hex over there. (laughs) Thumbless Vince Offer is actually in the closet filming this shit happening. Well, the cat meows and Gaylord hears it somehow. Bitch, Gaylord. Scott finds the camera. And now, now this I can't even condone because Jesus, it's fucked up. So he finds the camera. So he fucking backhands Joanna like real, real fucking hard, dude. Like, I mean, he just like slaps the fuck out of her. Just <laughs> and bruise on her face. Like she bro. He John Cena, that dude threw a fucking table in that boat, too. Yeah, I mean, like he shouldn't be this fucking strong. He hustled and tussled. <laughs> Hustle, loyalty, respect. Yeah. He did none of those things. No. Because <laughs> first of all, he didn't respect whamming. He said, these hoes ain't loyal. And this motherfucker's knocking my hustle. Mm-hmm. But yeah, Vince Offer <laughs> switches the tapes because Scott wanted to get the evidence that he was there. And he ends up switching the tapes out. So Scott gets this rando tape while Offer just... He happens to have the original one that he used before. Yeah. But a couple, but, a couple things. Yeah. One, a, a key just happens to go fly in the fucking window. That's, yeah. He just grabs it. Like he eats it out. Whatever. That, 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 like that was a focal point in this whole fight. It's like, weep. Okay. 
And he steps in broken glass when he's leaving. It just leaves bloody footprints everywhere. Just leave a trail. We'll yeah. come to find out, you know, <laughs> he, he finds the tape, goes to watch it, and it's the wrong fucking tape. Yeah, because his, uh, his uh, injured roommate comes along. Don't even remember the guy's name. Yeah, and they watch the tape, and it's Vince Offer trying to offer ShamWow. ShamWow. But it's all silent. You don't hear anything. But in actual reality, no, he's showing the key and he's like pointing at it and saying something. We don't know what the fuck it is. And Scott's just like, I'm fucked because, you know, if that tape gets out, blah, blah, blah. Bro, my dick on camera. Yeah. And my ass. So. Is this where he goes back to the boat? After they burn the tape, yes. Yeah, they cook it in the oven. Which I don't understand. How does that work? How do you. Bake a tape and it catches on fire. I don't know. I mean, it's very possible, but uh, I mean, I could be wrong. I probably am wrong, but I'm just saying like it would smolder. I would assume before it like catches on fire before, you know, it does anything. Right. But yeah, he goes back to the boat and tries to literally, (laughs) he tries to clean all the bloody footprints that he left (laughs) with fucking whiskey. whiskey. Oh my god. Yeah, because he finds the Vince Offer dude like dead in the toilet. Like he's in the fucking shitter, like face down with a it looks like a whole piece of wood is like shoved through his fucking mouth. And then he hears like the cat scream again. And Madame Moon is spinning around in her fucking wheelchair as the boat catches on fire. But there's this dude that looks like Dollar Store Punisher. And his name's Francis, so he can't possibly be like anything other than Francis Castle at this point. But he's got a shitload of tapes in his car. Scott is like in the boat. So he drives off when he sees the boat catching fire. And uh, Scott just fucking says to hell with this because the cops arrive very quickly. And he dives in the water. And the first thought I had was Mel Gibson just looking at him. Swim away, Meryl. (laughs) Swim away. You know, Francis, here's the thing. Daniel, that's the roommate's name because I called him deep shit Daniel. Yeah, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> fucking Zamir and Francis remind me of Home Dude from fucking uh, Miami Connection, which I thought was ironic. We were talking about that film earlier. But yeah, the same fucking Kenny Loggins looking face, facial hair, the mullet ish looking hair in the back, and the one earring on the side. Oh, you're talking about the. A friend! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that guy. <laughs> Like, it's almost like doubles of that particular person. You're yeah. not wrong. You have a tape of my friend. <laughs> you have a tape of a friend. Where is my friend? It's like getting cleaned up with ShamWow. But yeah, we find out that the Vince Offer dude is actually Jason Mortem, and he's the son of Reverend Mortem. And he died on the fucking boat. Punisher has the sex tape. It's like, I know who's on the fucking tape. And it's like, oh, great. Well, Scott has nightmares about fucking. Like, do you want to have fucking nightmares or nightmares about fucking? Because Scott has both. He's fucking and getting fucked. Yes, because deep shit Daniel rolls into the room and he's like, hey, it's the Rev's kid. And he jokes about uh, about Scott wasting him on his fucking boat because they have the same birthday. Yeah, it's ironic. June 6, 1966. That's a key thing. (laughs) Ha <laughs> ha key. <laughs> well, the Punisher searches Scott and Dan's apartment and he sees like a sh- like what you pointed out with. I thought it was fucking cool. There's like a, um, a shadow that gets cast from something he's holding or something that's in the room. And it looks like the Cobra. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, th- this film was interesting because they do a lot of the um, symbolism shots and the sequences where the magic is basically being cast onto the characters while, you know, they're going through some kind of like event or something. I thought that was pretty cool. Right. Well, deep shit Daniel comes home and gets confronted by Francis Castle. And he fucking just gets shot in the throat. Because let's be honest, that dude didn't fucking matter. Yeah. He didn't run enough rickshaws. Right. And then Madame Moon like sees this happening in her mind and then set and the apartment gets set on fire. And I really had to sit there and think, is this what happens when she orgasms? Like shit just sets on fire because she looks like she is just like having a good old time every fucking time some fire happens. It's- Fucking Queen Blaze having a good time. <laughs> having a good time. 
I just want to play that song with that sequence where she's spinning in place with the fire going up. <laughs> Dude. <laughs> I'm laughing about that shit. And I'm also laughing about the scene that comes after this. Okay. Scott finally like comes home and you know, he's got like the five o'clock shadow and fucking sunglasses, dude. Like, he's, Oh God. He walks up. There's like police, there's detectives, there's firemen. And he just walks up and he overhears some lady being like, yeah, that apartment got set on fire. And he just nopes and turns around and walks the other way. Like mm. no emotion. Just like, mm, nope. He <laughs> fucking walks away. That's a legitimate reaction, though. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care what the fuck happens. Just, nope. So, like, the police can't get into the dresser. And, and, and this is what pisses us off about this movie later. They can't open the drawer. I repeat, they can't open the drawer. So they can't possibly know what is inside of the top drawer that they can't open. They yeah. cannot open the fucking drawer. After all the forensics and investigation, which I thought was fucking. St- Whoever did the costume design for the forensics team, it looks like they just took red tape, like really glossy tape and just made the letters like, I don't know what the word was on the back of their costumes, but it just looked cheap as shit. Unless that was what they actually used back in that time frame in Miami, but still, it looked fucking cheap. Right. But yeah, they investigate, try to open a drawer. Something's obviously wrong. There's something about this drawer that they have to like, hmm, I suddenly know what it is. Because the dresser didn't burn like the rest of the place did. Hmm. Hmm. I know what to do with this edit. Let's cut to a milk delivery shot for Joanna, where Francis Castle poses as a milkman. And he's just like, you know, it's a shame about all these missing children out there. Let me in. I mean, that comes into play later, too. I'll just go ahead and give it away here. Her fucking child is missing because there's obviously a children's bedroom in this apartment. And supposedly Francis has him. And so he blackmails her into giving uh, Scott up to the police and basically uh, making a false accusation against him and saying that this is all his fault. That he killed the mortem kid. It was not post-mortem. Exactly. And present mortem, which is his father, is fucking at a church sermon mourning the loss of the kid. Joanna gives the false statement to the police. Scott sees his name all over the fucking TV at some random, like, Radio Shack looking place. And then uh, finds out Joanna ratted him out and gets chased by the police. So where does he go? To the strip club. To sit in Joanna's car. And it, <laughs> got yeah. this fucking scene, dude. It was just a chase sequence. That's all it really was. Yeah. I mean, I'm talking like when they get, do you talk about the car chase? Yeah. I'm talking about what he tells her in the backseat of this fucking car. Oh my God. Why did I forget about that part? Oh man. Okay. So he doesn't hold her by gunpoint or anything like that. No, he finds a used dirty needle <laughs> from a fucking dumpster in like the middle of like a cheap ass motel. It's like, I'm going to stick you and you'll get HIV or something. You know what? I love it. It's like, you, you, you know about AIDS, don't you? Yeah. You're going to find out. You're going to get the hiv. You're going to get got. Yeah, he threatens her with a fucking used needle. I mean, that would do it. But it's like improvising. Okay. This fucking car chase, though, because he's like, are we being followed? And she looks behind her, obviously being followed. No. <laughs> <laughs> fucking they go to the top floor of this garage. And he's like, get out. We're switching cars. Then they're arguing about the boat situation. Francis shows up. Punisher beats his ass and Joanna drives off in the other car. And Scott is running on foot for this whole whole fucking shot. At one point when he's hopping down onto this air conditioning unit, I thought he was going to just jump. Like it looked further down than it was. I was like, oh, sh- oh, OK. He just fucking <laughs> took a step down. Yeah. This whole scene is a jumbled mess because he winds up getting in the car with Joanna and holds her at gunpoint. I don't even remember how he got the fucking gun, but he held, he held her at gunpoint. And it's like, you fucking drive. And then we know, of course, we cut to Madame Moon and she's, she's satisfied as all fuck right here. I mean, there was no fire, but I mean, she still looks like she had a good time. And, and, and here's the other awkward shit, okay, about like as far as people like falling in love with each other and shit. They're arguing at a fucking hotel and then they awkwardly have sex in the shower. Because he gets in there and he still has his jeans on. It's almost as bad as Neil Breen showering in his bloody hospital robe. You can't make any of this more awkward. You just did. Madam Moon is listening in on this fucking conversation about this key that's missing. And it's the key to the locker with the artifact, which, I mean, go figure. Everybody's killing over this key. So Joanna 
is on the phone with her friend at a pay phone. And her friend says that she's got to see her. Well, her friend is being interrogated by Francis. So she leaves and then Scott follows her to this boat site. And then the cat shows up and you're just like, oh, the key is there. Like the cat is like, hey, I'm going to try to tell you the key is in the water. You need to go here and get it. So he fucking dives in and gets it. Well, she runs away to the warehouse where the boats are and her friend shows up and with her child. Yep. She pretty much just uses him to get her child back. Apologizes like, I'm sorry. Like, no, you're not. (laughs) Well, I mean, (laughs) uh, Francis beats the shit out of him. Then like, just leaves him. Like I'm talking like Hulk throws him into a fucking car and like slams him on the ground and just beats his fucking ass and leaves him for dead. Which is weird because like the, he's about to shoot him and the snake appears in front of Francis and protects Scott somehow. I, don't, I didn't understand that at first. Chinese magic. Yep. And then the police are talking about this artifact that they find in the library somehow, somewhere, because I guess one of the cops had like some sort of like mystical history lessons or some shit. No, he was just in the horoscopes. Yeah, something like that, basically. And like they're like, oh, yeah, Scott and Morton were both born on 6-6 six, six of 66. Hmm. Yeah, because they draw out like 9999. It's like, oh, wait, hold on. Turn it around. It's 6666. Six, six, six. And then that's the whole fucking thing here, right? So somewhere in all this shit, Scott has called the cops and professed his innocence, but then he gets entranced by the pussy. The, the, the cat. The, yeah. The, the cat. The feline. Yeah. So he disappears by the time the cops get there. And the cat leads him back to his apartment and he gets his present out of his dresser. And then the cops show up as he disappears. And then this is the part that we were talking about. The cops fucking show up and the fucking cop says there was a Chinese talisman in the drawer. How the fuck do you know you couldn't open that shit earlier? You dumb fuck. How? I want to know. Like, this enrages the shit out of me. Did you know because the, bu- the dresser wasn't burned? Or did you know because the dresser drawer wouldn't open? Like... Are those two magical properties of the talisman immunity to the fire or you can't open shit? I just, I just want to know. I know I'm probably being, you know, over analytical about it. No, it makes sense because how do they know what that was? For all they know, it could have been a damn lock drawer with just nothing but nudie magazines and shit. It's just a penis pump. It's a very old penis pump. Or fucking, you know, butt plug or something. That's right. No, it could have just been that, or it could have been like a very fire-retardant dresser, and nothing could have fucking burned that day. I thing. want that dresser, if that's the case. How did they deduce that that particular Chinese talisman was in that drawer? The fact that it was opened. Oh my god, that's what was in there. Like, come the fuck on. I don't believe that shit for a second. Neither do I. Well, Scott goes to Madame Moon's for some Madame Poon, I guess, at this point. Well, well, she says that she and her cat <laughs> have been watching over him since his birth, and that, that line just killed me. Can't make enough pussy jokes in this one. Right, and basically, basically she says that the divine will has been entrusted to him with the talisman. But somehow the cop knows all about this talisman and how... The urn of wisdom will prevent the evil from returning or some bullshit. And the numbers, like you said earlier, equals his birthday. And then it cuts to Reverend Mortem being at Francis's house. And basically you find out that Francis has been paid off by the Reverend to kill his fucking kid because he wants this artifact and he wants to obliterate Madame Moon because Madame Moon is explaining to Scott that when she was younger, Mortem fucked her and stole the statue, which aged her and ended her immortality. Like she went from like youthful to fucking raisin in a fucking five second interval. Let's talk about the scene where Francis goes for the locker with the key. Oh, because holy shit. That was painful to watch. He became like full on Jesus there with the fucking stigmata. (laughs) Dude, that fucking... Okay, the closer he gets to this locker, this key is just getting hotter and hotter. It burns through the palm of his hand and out the back of his hand, and it hits the floor and melts through the fucking tile. And he is not reacting at all. No. He's just like, wrap it. (laughs) Right. Bop it. Wrap Wrap it. it. Tap it. Cringe it. (laughs) Anyway, so as this happens, he calls the rev back, and he's just like, I fucked up, dude. I fucked up real bad. And Madam keeps explaining to Scott that like it's your job to recover the key and close the circle, and Joanna will help you. Oh, it's the same bitch that betrayed him basically twice. 
And then he looks over. He's like, it's not over. Everybody betray me. I'm fed up with this world and fucking leaves. Not really, but I mean, it's he bullshit. It's bullshit. I did not hit her. It's not true. It's bu- actually I did. Fuck. Oh, I did. I did. Oh, hi, moon. <laughs> and then he fucking tells her, like, you know, I would have believed you if she told me. And I'm like, no, you fucking wouldn't have, dude. And this part cracks me the fuck up because you pointed this shit out. And like, they, they're going to search for this key, but they're bringing the fucking child along. You're endangering this kid. <laughs> Like, you knew what was going on way before now. Your kid was kidnapped. And you're going to bring him with you. And then somehow in the, in the next, like, minute or so, she has found a babysitter because that child is not with her. And, uh, yeah, so the Rev fucking shows up to Madam Moons and the cat and the Cobra maul the fuck out of him. But, dude, he just, he shoves the cat and the cat slides. And then he just grabs the Cobra, like, around the throat and just shoves it across the floor and he's like now you'll never stop me it's like bitch they're still alive i I shall kill you i just thought it was funny he's like yeah she was pretty much handicapped she's like i am still defending myself or i'm still have some kind of a way to defend myself or some shit and he's just like attack cat and he just he fucking like close up the sign he's got "Ah!" like just like stiff body just (laughs) just glided across on a cable so fucking funny (laughs) like Meow. i call you bitch <laughs> but yeah is that when this when the um that fucking like uh statue it's not a statue it's more like a mural looking thing where the 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 it was the pedestal that the the little figure was in yeah it starts smoking yeah it starts vaping hard yeah it does and then rev is like choking and he's like i'm leaving oh i'll get you next time oh my lord and savior this is Cannabis. Uh, oh, I can't do this dank shit. <laughs> he smokes, chokes, and bails, dude. Yep. So Joanna and Scott are at the at the station looking for the fucking key where the cat's waiting with the key. Dude, I swear to God, this cat is the MVP of this whole fucking movie. Best cat ever. He's literally just laying on top of the key. He's like, oh, hey, here you go. Yeah, well, he grabs the artifact out of the locker. And then Francis just out of nowhere, like Randy Orton with an RKO, just shows the fuck up and chases him and grabs the fuck. Like he, he just bolts. He's like, nope, fuck you. I'm leaving. <laughs> so they fucking run outside and they're running down a fucking train track. Well, Scott like biffs it and picks the shit back up and runs. And God damn it. We he gets hit. Dude, Francis gets hit by a fucking Mack truck. Oh, my God. The the rag doll of these two films are just top quality cheese factor because <laughs> as soon as he gets hit like it's literally a split second you can tell it's a fucking like dummy and it just sucks it underneath the fucking rig <laughs> just, whoop. you can even see the wood platform that's holding it up and shit now, now granted y'all he's facing the grill of the rig goes underneath full body long ways but whenever they find him again He's under the wheel between the two wheels underneath the truck door dead. How, how does that work? You go from one position and you basically go perpendicular. Not with, I mean, nobody was touching the dude. Right. So like Joanna tells the cops that Scott is innocent and that they wouldn't believe the whole story, but the te- detectives like, Oh, you know, tell me again. You might be surprised. As a snake, the snake slithers out of Francis's eye, which is pretty fucking disgusting. Mm. Scott gives the idol back to Madame Moon and she puts it on the shelf and, and immediately like can walk and becomes young again. Says, oh, Reverend's the last idol that we have to defeat. But, you know, he's going to do it himself. So we get to like the end of the movie. Holy shit, dude. This is some good shit right here. Yeah, he's um, given the sermon. And. None of the shit that he says really fucking matters. It's the fact that he's slowly just losing his fucking hell, like, all over the place. He just starts, like... (laughs) Because, basically, it was cursed upon him for doing everything he's done. He's becoming the boar. The dark entity icon that the figure was based off of is infesting his magic into the Reverend. And everybody's like losing their shit. So he walks up to his wife. He's like, you got to believe me because 
Madam Moon tells, like, it's all his fault. Like, he did this. He's the reason why his son's dead and all this other shit. Yeah, like, she's popped up on the monitors in front of everybody and shit. Yeah, they lose all feet and stuff. And he's begging for his wife, like, you believe me, Dolce? And she's like, no, I've been silent for too long. You're the devil. And shoots the shit out of him as soon as the cops arrive. And they're, like, literally holding her back. And I thought they were going to put her away for good until you see the reverend's body fucking transform into the pig into the boar and it's like just grotesque like i can't remember what film it was it was a werewolf film where it was um the it was a it was a film it was hemlock grove the transformation where the actual mouth of the wolf comes out of the mouth of the human that's how the pig mouth came out the snout because it was literally just coming out of his fucking face like that the hooves were coming out of his hands from the top and from the feet. And he just laid there like a bloody split open carcass with the party, the body parts showing. I was like, dude, this is legit. Yeah. That's some good practical effects, man. Like that's some good body horror shit. And I forgot to mention the movie is directed by uh, Sergio Martino, who is a, a very, very, very well-known Italian director has done a ton of shit. It's so, like, th- this was beautiful. Love this fucking shot. Mm-hmm. So, Everybody realizes that the Reverend was like this fucking like demonic entity thing. Scott and Joanna meet up and they're going to go visit Madam Moon, but the apartment is completely empty except for a book that she leaves behind and the cat. And, you know, we're kind of left to assume that maybe Madam left the apartment for them to live in with the kid and shit because of all they did for her. And I mean, it's the end of the movie. They just, it just, it's over. Oh, look, Scott, we got a new concrete pad. Sweet. Fuck yeah. The view is awesome. Yeah. Look at all that cocaine. (laughs) In Miami somewhere. Uh, I think it's pretty fucking safe to say American Rickshaw wins this week. Yeah, he told me a lot of y'all on Twitter were hoping that Jim Cotta won. I was like watching these two films. I'm like, (laughs) it's not even fucking close. No, definitely not. I mean, yeah, sure. Jim Cotta is probably the more well-known cult film out of the two of these and it's definitely been memed to death and it's been made fun of so fucking much but goddamn american rickshaw definitely has it's like what the fuck moments and like all the things that make it fit into this category we speak of every couple of weeks but holy shit it, it was just a good fucking film mm-hmm. like you know it definitely has its moments but shit it it, it held up and i like the plot i i really dug the whole witchcraft plot and holy shit you know the fact that old Fucking Mitch Gaylord can very much act his way out of a paper bag. Yep. Good fucking job. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) There there were were too many factors against Jim Cotta for it to win, to be honest. So. Yep. American rickshaw. That's chef's kiss. Eating up all the Parmesan. You were just too cheesy, Jim Cotta. That's right. You didn't have enough pork. All cheese, no pork. Some fried pork. Fried pork. Yes, crispy pork. Crispy. Crispy pork. Visit SuperMediaBrosPodcast.com to listen to past, present, and future episodes. And to get crispy pork. To get crispy pork. All day, every day. Check out all the other shows on the Odd Pods Media Network. Scroll up and follow us on social media. Buy some merch. Subscribe to us on YouTube. Do all of the things. She gets like a mask, like a face mask with the boar snout coming out of it. And put Super Media Brothers somewhere on there. (laughs) (laughs) Just put like meat. Meatia. Mm, Meatia. Super Meaty Bros. What are y'all trying to be like Bebop? No. Rickshaw. Uh, yeah, we're trying to be like Rickshaw. We're trying to be like the American Rickshaw, buddy. The dark boar. The dark boar. That was the funny thing, too. This movie was boring. Ha 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 ha. But not in the bad way. No, not at all. Y'all can roast me later. It's fine. Roast him like crispy pork. Roast him like a Borg on a hot fucking fire. You know, I can't imagine. I, I'm not on Twitter or any social media. I can just imagine everybody just groaning on there post wise just like oh my god he makes so many fucking dad jokes and just terrible puns and i'm just like fuck off if, if y'all haven't listened to this fucking show like the, the 
we we pretty much are just made of dad jokes and bad puns. I mean, fuck. It doesn't get old to us, though. I mean, the shit's fun. It's just built into our DNA at this point. Join us next week where we uh, we take some of your uh, fun, favorite, and underground pop culture figures and just cross them over with one another. And it, it, we, we know what you think. It's, it, uh, we're going to put fucking Batman with Spider-Man. No, that's no fuck. No, we, we've got no, we, we want to do shit that will probably never be done or hasn't been done. That'll be a lot of fun. No, I, I, I just want you guys to, to listen to that one and, and roast us with your, with your fucking best hate possible in the comments of wherever the fuck you're listening to us or following us. Or you can not be that way and be like, hey, what about this crossover? I think it's pretty cool. And be like, yeah, we think it's cool too. Or, hey, no, that sucks. Yeah. Just leave constructive criticism. Yeah. God damn it. No, we don't want to say it sucks. We'll just be like, eh, that sounds cool, but nah. It's, it was okay. It, it was okay. But yeah, icons and icons become iconic. Yeah. In the weirdest way possible, or the funniest way, or the epic way. I don't know. It's just going to be a, just a casual thing. It's not even like a list or a, you know, a tier list or it's any gonna, of that shit. It's going to be a way. That's right. Do you know the way? Do you know the way? Do you, do you know the way? I know the way out of here, though. Through the door. Through the fucking door. <laughs> we appreciate you for listening to our glorious, incessant rambling every week. Thanks for stopping by. Thanks for listening. We're going to get out of here now. This has been episode 164, Cult Cinema Showdown 69. Nice. Jim Cotta versus American Rickshaw. Until next week, I've been Midnight Agent Raw. And I'm Okami. Shades on. Uh.